Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. And... I'm just streaming it live on uh, the Mr. Mountain Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Live on uh, the Mr. Mountain Facebook page. Yeah. Is the sound okay when? Yeah, it's kind of echoing a bit. Oh, okay. How about now? Is the sound okay when? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of echoing a bit. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it seems to be now? on some kind of delay. Okay oh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of echoing a bit. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, it seems to be on some kind of delay. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of echoing a bit. Now, now. Oh, is it okay now? Yeah. It seems fine now. Yeah. Mm. Is that good for you, Leela? Yes, it's fine. I, as you say, there's a bit of an echo, but I can hear you very clearly. Yeah, I just wanted to see like uh, how the sound is right now. So, mm. are you expecting many people, uh, Nabi? Uh, I know uh, what's happening is we'll start this show and we'll we'll put uh, put the audience in the background, you know, and later on, you know, at the, in the end, we'll have, uh, you know, like question answer round. So after the okay. reading, yeah. So awesome. maybe it's uh, if you could mute, mute uh, and you know, like, uh, so can, so can I can start the program or? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, is it is it okay when now? Uh, I think uh, the screen is okay. Yeah, screen is can fine. You hear me? And, uh, yeah, can hear you oh. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just wondering if uh, if it's coming okay in Facebook uh, live. Uh, just checking the sound. Uh, yeah. So I've got this sound check as well, and uh, maybe we're good to go. Uh, So I've got this sound check as well. Um... <laughs> uh, dear friends, uh, a very warm welcome to you all. This program is organized by Mission Mountain Residency uh, and in a, co in a co collaboration with Bemis Scotland and uh, uh, it's uh, we are very much privileged to have uh, Dr. Wen Price, uh, an accomplished poet, uh, uh, and my guru as well. So, to start with, uh, I just wanted to start with a small lines by Robert Burns. Oh, my love is like a red red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So today's uh, we are uh, commemorating 
uh, on behalf of Burns Day. Uh, Robert Burns was known fairly as Rabbi Burns, the National Bard of uh, Scotland, and uh, he's known uh, throughout the whole world. And uh, he wrote both in English as well as in Scots. And uh, again, proud to welcome Dr. Wen Price. Wen Price is a senior lecturer in English and creative writing. His teaching and his scholarship specialisms are in 20th century American poetry and fiction, and he has published widely in the UK, Ireland, the US and Australia. He has won numerous national and international awards for fiction and poetry, and has twice been a finalist in the Manchester International Poetry Prize 2013-14, one of the UK's richest poetry awards. His short story collection, Furnace Fred Books 2012, was longlisted for the Frank O'Connor Prize and nominated for the Saltar Scottish First Book of the Year. His most recent full length uh, publications are a novel, Mercy Seat from Fred Books 2015, and a pamphlet collection of poetry, Fossil Record, Smith Doorstep 2015, one of Carol and Duffy's Four Laureate Choices. His story, Everyone's the Same Inside, appears in Best European Fiction 2017. Uh, welcome to the show, Wen, and how are you feeling today? Okay, thanks, Rabbi. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. That was uh, a very, very kind and generous introduction. Um, yeah, a bit cold. The boiler broke down a couple of days ago in the house, so <laughs> I'm oh, well okay. wrapped up. But apart from that, I'm uh, fine. <laughs> uh -huh. And so we'll be giving away uh, Wen's book, which I have over here. Uh, it's uh, I've got some books over here. Uh, this is a Mercy Seat, and we've got this fossil record as well. So we'll give it to uh, five, uh, six audience, uh, six participants. And uh, so to start with, uh, Wen, what is poetry for you? Like, what is poetry? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, starting with a big question. That'd be, uh, I think, um, yeah, I'm sure it's slightly different for every poet, you know, or every poet would maybe put it slightly differently. But uh, I think maybe one thing that just about any poet would have in common is uh, a sense that poetry is, is kind of doing your best. You know, it's trying to do your best with language. Um, is trying to find exactly the right words, exactly the right rhythm, exactly the right cadence for the feeling and the, the thought that you're trying to, to carry across to the reader. So I think, you know, in whatever way you try to do that, you know, whatever style you're working in or whether your poetry is, uh, you know, towards the more accessible side of the spectrum or the more difficult side of the spectrum. I think the one thing any poet has in common is that you're doing your best to find uh, exactly the right form of language to do the job that you're asking it to do. And, uh, and I think the value of that is, um, it's not necessarily a kind of perfectionism, but it's a, it's a kind of taking language seriously. It's kind of, is trying to get a kind of honesty into the language, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that you're not making stuff up. I mean, of course you are. In anything imaginative, you're, you know, you're altering reality maybe, but you're trying to, to use language itself in, in an honest way, in a way that is, uh, you know, as, as authentic as it can be to the, to the experience you're trying to create for the reader. And uh, I think that's that's the particular value of it. I think it's it's true for good prose as well, of course. You know, for good fiction writing as well. But I think poetry is is so much more compressed, and you have so so much less space uh, to create that effect. Then you know, there's there's an extra premium on that kind of discipline. You know, that kind of uh, determination to get the right words. And get them in the right order, basically. Yeah. Uh, I guess you grew up in Wales, is it? Yeah, South Wales. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, I've I've seen in your poems uh, there's a <coughs> uh, 
snapshot of childhood days, you know, like, so how did your childhood shape your writing? And uh, uh, because I, you can see that uh, woven into your poems, you know, uh, can you? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, my brothers and my sister and myself were all first generation uh, kind of university entrance here. Yeah, there was nobody in our family had uh, gone on in education uh, until our generation. So um, I, I didn't grow up in a kind of uh, poetry rich environment sort of thing. My father liked reading and liked having a lot of books in the house. And some of those were poetry. He never read poetry himself really, but uh, you know, some of the books he had from the Reader's Digest and so on would be things like uh, Palgrave's Golden Treasury and so on. And even as a very young kid, uh, I was drawn to them. You know, I would, uh, for some reason or another, uh, you know, those that really attracted me. Um, I loved poetry. My mother loved poetry uh, and would sometimes recite poems that she'd learned as a, as a girl you know, just simple poems that she'd learned by heart when she was at school. Um, so that gave me, that must have given me some kind of interest in it. But um, yeah, it was very random. I had no no formal encouragement to read poetry. And uh, my parents thought it was uh, very strange that I had this kind of interest, you know. Uh, I remember coming home, I'd gone to Cardiff to buy uh, a book of poetry uh, because that was where I had to go, you know, I had to get the train to Cardiff to get to a bookshop, basically. Uh, and I came back with, it was William Blake, it was Blake's selected poems. And uh, I was about 14, I think. And my mother said, oh, off you bought in Cardiff thinking I'd gone to buy clothes or something, you know, or whatever. And uh, I showed this book and she said, oh my God, you mustn't, you mustn't go buying poetry books. You get beaten up on the train. <laughs> if anybody catches you reading poetry, you know, you'll get beaten up. And uh, which she was probably right, you know, probably would have uh, would have been a bit hairy if uh, it just wasn't the thing that you did in that kind of culture. But um, yeah. Uh, so talking about the recent, uh, uh, you were the main judge in the Gerald Rochford Poetry Prize, and uh, can you share your experience about that? Uh, because uh, there was a, 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 a entries from forty one countries. Uh, nearly 736 uh, entries. Uh, can you yeah, I, I think my main uh, feeling about it was, as I've said to you before, I mean, it was uh, just shock <laughs> at how, you know, just the international reach of it, which was great to see. Uh, but yeah, it was astounding. Um, you know, when you first mentioned it to me, I thought it would be quite a local competition. Um, and I thought most of the interest would be you know, amongst people who've known Gerard or gone to some of his readings and so on, or associated mm -hmm. with books and beans. And some of the entries were, of course, you know, I think one of the winners was an Abdinshire guy, wasn't it? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but the, the, the kind of scale of the competition really took me by surprise. I remember when you told me there'd been so many hundreds of entries, you know, I was... <laughs> <laughs> but delighted you know it's absolutely incredible and uh, and a great you know a wonderful way to honor uh, Gerard's memory you know and, and totally appropriate because Gerard always had you know he always had a kind of international outlook to me you know he was never parochial uh, you know his his whole kind of attitude to poetry and to life was uh, very much international and uh, and welcoming and you know he was never stuck in his own little, uh, mm. little box and it's great that the competition was had such a wide sort of reach you know i think that was uh, exactly as gerard would have loved you know would have wished for yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh... Uh, what was one one thing notable about this uh, prize, like um, in in comparison to others? Like, you, did you note anything different than uh, than the other prizes? I don't. I mean, I think there was a very understandable emphasis on uh, themes of family, 
uh, partly loss as well, and kind of uh, connections, you know, love, um, grieving, that kind of thing. A lot of the poems had that in common, and uh, I, I think it, it sort of raised the standard across the board in some ways, in that uh, most of the people entering the competition, I think, were kind of tuned in to writing about things that mattered to them you know, rather than just trying to write a poem as an exercise or do something clever for a competition. You know, I think the fact that it was a memorial competition um, and so there, and there was that encouragement uh, to write about human things, you know, things that, uh, that connect human beings on quite a deep level. I think that did, you know, help in, in generating a sort of uh, quite a high standard of, uh, of entry you know there were very you know there weren't any poems that I came across certainly uh, once we got to the the long listing and short listing kind of stages uh, there weren't any poems that were just trivial or mm. um, you know kind of thoughtless you know there was there was a kind of depth of thought and a desire to uh, get at something genuinely human in, in all of the poems I read, sometimes in very surprising ways, you know, and sometimes very funny ways, you know, they weren't all somber, but uh, yeah, they were all, there was a kind of um, seriousness about, yeah, each of the poems, which was good to see. Yeah. Uh, as Robert Frost once said, uh, a poem begins with a lump in the throat. Do you feel such discomfort or... <laughs> Yeah, your writing journey, you know. Do you yeah. feel when a poem comes to you, do you feel that way or yeah, I think I think what Frost is getting at there is um that really if something's worth putting into poetry, then it should at least have the power to put a lump in your throat. You know, it it should it shouldn't just be a throwaway thought, you know, mm -hmm. which you could scribble down, you know, and forget about. You know, the if it's worth putting the, the kind of attentiveness onto it that, that you need to do for poetry, then it should be something that affects you, that, that matters to you. I think that's mm -hmm. really important for all young poets, you know, is to not to think about poetry as just a matter of ideas or a matter of being clever, but mm -hmm. to, to try to kind of respect their own experience, to respect the world around them, um, and the whole point of poetry is that you're trying to find a language that reflects that level of care, that level of respect for, mm -hmm. for life, you know, in the world around you. Um, there's that, that great poem uh, by W.B. Yeats, as well, of course, the, the circus animals desertion, which ends with, uh, I must lie down where all the ladders start in, uh, and begin with the foul rag and bone shop of the heart, you know, and, and that's a similar thought, you know, that, that real poetry, it doesn't come from themes and ideas. Real poetry comes from the heart. It comes from the, the rag and bone shop of the heart, you know, all the, all the leftover things in our lives, all the, the things that have troubled us and maybe things that we've lost, things that we've discarded, the little things that are actually uh, the things that make up our, our inner lives, you know, are kind of all the secret things, uh, maybe even shameful things, but you know, the, those kind of true things that, that are parts of our inner lives, not the big fancy ideas about, uh, you know, one thing or another that we can just, yeah, play around with. Uh, I saw that a lot of people, you know, I've, I've met, uh, uh, they, they resort to poetry when they are at loss or if there's a tragedy or uh, when they're excessively happy, you know, like, so do you think poetry changes the perspective or the lens that will look towards the world? Or is it a window, you know, like... Yeah, like yeah. yeah I, think, I think the reason why people kind of turn to poetry at, at moments of extreme emotion is because they, they have that instinctive sense that the only way we can make sense of the 
the big things in life, you know, the really painful or joyful things in life is, you know, to give it a use of language that is special, that, that takes time to think about. I think it's about breaking habits. You know, most of the time we go through life and we use language in a completely habitual way. You know, you say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Uh, you know, or the, when you're asked how you think about something, you think, well, I don't know. You know, we, we don't take the time to really question the world around us, to really question how we feel about the world around us or how we feel about the world within us. You know, all the complexity of years of experience, all the decisions we've made, good and bad, you know, all the compromises we've made, all the, all the good things we've done, all the bad things we've done. It's very difficult to spend too much time in that, atmosphere because it's so hard you know it's too yeah. difficult but when we write poetry we can give ourselves permission to spend maybe a day or, or hours or maybe a week where you you do allow yourself into that that atmosphere where you're you're really thinking seriously about how you might put a name to some of your feelings and thoughts and the complexities of life and uh, I think people kind of understand that people have an instinctive understanding that's what poetry is kind of all about you know and so when something very painful happens to them it's like a natural response to try and find the right words to articulate that it's a very human response you know maybe maybe it's one of the main things that that makes us special as as a species you know is is that uh, awareness that we're not complete without language you know that that actually is is what gives our emotions and our kind of our experiences a kind of meaning you know so yeah i think and obviously you want poetry to be more than that you know if poetry is just spilling our guts sort of thing then it's not very likely to be to be very memorable poetry because you've got to make it available to other people if you you know, so you have to find words that aren't just significant to you, but that uh, in some way carry your carry the intensity of your thought and feeling over to another another person, and that's very difficult, of course, you know, to do really well. So that it's uh, you mean to say it lends that universality, you know? Uh, yeah, it's it's looking for the the connective tissue, as it were. Mm -hmm. It might not be universal in you know, in a, an all-encompassing sense, but mm. it'll, it, I think poetry tries to zoom in on the, on the connective things, on the things that are recognizable, you know, that people find recognizable in their, in their shared experience. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, can you talk about your, uh, books you know like furnace and mercy seat mercy yeah yeah so those are uh i think both are so, a collection of short stories isn't it? uh furnace is short stories mercy seat is a novel um oh, and oh. yeah i mean all my life really i've, I've switched mm. between poetry and prose uh i mm. started off writing poetry you know as a young mm. guy right up until my early 20s and then switched to writing prose uh, for 20 odd years. You know, I didn't write poetry for years and years and years, uh, just wrote short stories. Then I went back to writing poetry um, for uh, about 15 years. And now I'm in a prose phase again. And all I can, all I can write is prose. <laughs> so it's, it's a funny thing. I don't know why that happens, um, but yeah, uh, all my life I've kind of, switch between one or the other uh at, you know for years at a time and, yeah it's like my brain won't do uh finds it hard to do both at once so uh, so can you work both on uh, the same both genres genres at the same time or do you need uh, like to clear ahead before you go to the yeah i uh, it tends to be that if i'm if i'm in a kind of prose part of my life then yeah, thoughts come to me as prose, you know, or as stories. Um, whereas if I'm in a kind of poetry phase, then 
everything seems to come to me as poetry. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know why that is, but it's, it's something to do with language, obviously, you know, and the way in which all these triggers come. Um, I, what I find is if I'm in a period where I'm writing a lot of poetry, then things come to me quite rhythmically, you know, and it'll come as a line of poetry. Whereas mm. if I'm in a phase of my life where I'm mainly writing stories, then it comes as dialogue or maybe a scene, you know, uh, something more kind of visual or something more, more narrative. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so talking about writing, you know, have you traveled anywhere particularly for writing you know, on a writing program is, or do you need a specific environment to write? Yeah, I need, um, I would say the main thing I need to write steadily is uh, a lot of solitude. You know, I don't do well if I'm constantly distracted by anything. So I have done a fair bit of traveling um, just to try and get in a completely isolated kind of space. I like, I like going to countries where, you know, English isn't spoken. So I like being surrounded by other languages, partly because I don't understand them. <laughs> so it's, it's not it's a different kind of distraction, you know, you're kind of, <laughs> you're immersed in, uh, it, it sort of forces you to pay attention more because you don't understand what's going on. So you're kind of, uh, you use your eyes more and your other senses more and you're, you're more alert because you're in an unfamiliar culture and, and you're surrounded by unfamiliar words. Uh, I find that really helpful. I like that. I like it a lot. Um, so, but yeah, recently with COVID and everything, I haven't been, uh, <laughs> haven't been able to get away much. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So you mean to say that uh, you, know, you want to defamiliarize yourself, like yeah. you want to have that strangeness around you, that, that arcaneness around you, you know, like... Yeah. Yeah. So what does that do? Even, even I like it. You know, like I, I love languages that I don't understand. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> what does I, that do? In, I, in, yeah. In, it's probably quite a complicated thing in your brain, you know, sort of the psychological effects. And I, I suspect it is something to do with uh, because you can't make sense of things linguistically. I think the other parts of your brain compensate. You know, it's like when people have become blind in later life or deaf and their other senses become more sensitive. I think it's a little bit like that, that, you know, because you can't rely on the habits of language and the habits of communicating that we do when we're in, when we're using a familiar language, then you're forced to rely more on visual cues, on tones of voice, on how body language, you know, on little cultural markers to, I think your brain works harder to try and make sense of what's going on around you. Even just sitting in a cafe, you know, I think your brain works much harder to figure out how the waiters are doing their job and how you, how you manage to order a particular type of cup of tea or coffee or whatever, because you can't just do what you would normally do if you were in a, a, a culture and immersed in a language that you're familiar with. So I think it's helpful for that. I think it's great for writers to kind of, yeah, to be in those defamiliarized situations where uh, it, just, it just sharpens up other parts of your brain, I think, and throws you back on your body, throws you back on your, your senses much more so that you're not just caught up in the usual habits of how you make sense of things. Uh, this... This is one of the questions that I've been, uh, that I keep digging up in each and every interviews, you know, or with, uh, uh, whether it's with Joan Burnside or Kathleen Jemmy. Uh, again, how long do you keep your works? Like, especially how long do you keep your poems? Because uh, I've, I've seen a lot of poets or would be poets who want to write, but they are, they don't have the patience to keep their work, you know. Uh, so, uh, what advice or how? Or what's your practice? Would you would you yeah. share that? With all Varies people? from poem to poem. Uh, to be honest, I think some poems that I initially wrote maybe twenty or thirty years ago 
I could probably still go back to and play around with because I'm not really satisfied with them. Others, you just feel, yeah, that's as much as I can do with it. And that doesn't mean it's perfect by any means, but you, you kind of recognize that you've done the best you can with that particular poem. You know, that it's, it's saying something in a way that you think, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I can improve on that. And that's the right time to step away from it. But um, I think a mistake that poets can make, even great poets um, like Derek Mann, the Irish poet, was a wonderful poet. He died quite recently, but he would constantly keep going back to his his earlier work and revising it. Very often, making it worse, you know. And I think you've got to be careful of that too, because you can't, you know, you've got to respect a poem as a thing in itself. I think it's like bringing up children and constantly trying to interfere in their lives, you know, once they're adults or something. You know, you shouldn't do that. You've got to give the poem freedom. You've got to say, okay, this is this is the poem. This is its kind of identity, um, and you've just got to let it get on with itself and and not constantly try to change it and make it say what you want it to say twenty years later. Because we all change. We all, you know, the way we look at the world changes as we get older, and I think it's. Yeah, I think it's wrong to go back to earlier poems and to try to torture them to say what you would say now, just because they're saying something that you would have said 20 years ago. You've got to, there's like a, an integrity about it. You know, you've got to let poems have their own integrity. You can't impose your later sort of intentions on a, on a 20 year old poem or a 10 year old poem or even a two year old poem. You know, just let them be once once you've done your best with them uh, to begin with. And, and that might take years in itself, you know, and I, I'm sure you know this yourself. I mean, there are some poems that just never feel finished. You know, there are some poems that, that take years to feel finished. And you know within yourself, you know, and that's something you have to be honest about as a writer. Uh, same with stories, of course. You know, you just have to be honest with yourself about whether or not something feels finished yet and once it does i think you should leave it alone once you've done your best with it at a particular phase in your life i think then you should leave it alone even if you don't like it 10 years later you know you've got to say well it's not my yeah it's not my job to go changing a poem that because the poem belongs to other people once other people have read it it belongs to them you know and uh, you shouldn't go messing around with it. Mm. Yeah. And I think so you've gone uh, on a lot of residencies and is there any particular place or time of the day or night that you, you can recall, you know, that's a quite crazy way you wrote really good poems, which, which you thought in the, let's say in the first draft, okay, this is, I've done enough, you know, like what, oh, oh, this was really good. You know, is yeah. there any ambience or place that you'd like to share? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I wouldn't say uh, there's any particular time of day that I'd associate with that, but there are definitely poems that just come in a rush and, you know, you get almost all of it down in one burst. And, you know, obviously you go back to it and polish it a little bit, but, um, yeah, I can certainly think of quite a few poems that have come that way. And I think very often... Yeah, trying to think if there's any commonality to that. I mean, I don't think there is. I mean, some I can think about. I remember writing one poem uh, in a pub in Ireland. I was driving around in, in my camper van uh, just around Ireland and I pulled into a tiny little pub, very remote in the middle of the mountains um, and just went in for a, for a rest. I was just going to stay there for the day and the night. And, uh, and wrote a whole poem, just very spontaneous, just sitting at the, the little table with a pint of Guinness. And that was lovely. Um, yeah, it's, you never know when that's gonna happen to you, I think. But um, yeah, I, I do a lot of writing at night. You know, I'm, I'm a night person rather than a day person, but uh, yeah. But no, I, you never really know when you're just gonna get one of those afternoons or evenings or nights 
where everything seems to fit together quite quickly. And, yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, uh, you have a camper van, is it, or, which you often uh, take for your trips. I don't know, that, that might be quite personal for you, but if you don't mind, could you share like how has that trips and camper vans, you know, uh, enriched your uh, poems? Yeah, I, think, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, sadly, I haven't been able to get away much for the last five years or so. I've just been so busy at work, but. Uh, and then COVID, of course. But yeah, I used to I used to do that a lot, and uh, it was just a very handy way of being able to get solitude. You know, you can just hop in your van, and it's like a metal tent. You know, you can take it um, almost anywhere, and you know, be self sufficient for for at least a few days, uh, sometimes much longer. You know, and uh, yeah, really, I found that really good. I think one reason why. I haven't written much poetry lately is because I just haven't been getting away as much. I haven't been getting that kind of solitude. Mm -hmm. So hopefully in the future, I'll, I'll get back to that again. I'd definitely like to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. I think so. If there's any comments from anybody, uh, Leela Didi says, I loved reading your poems in fossil record, especially a prayer and allotment. So please, uh, that invited uh, you invited uh, that invited me to meet you. Wish it had been in person. So, oh, thanks, Leila. <laughs> that's, so that's lovely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, we'll we'll see if there's if there if there's any questions you want to ask. Uh, please do write in our uh, the comment section. And, yeah. Can uh, I uh, ask a question? Oh, no, uh, sir. Uh, uh, Gopesh will maybe yeah. will. We'll get back to the question round after oh, the, at the end. And yeah, the end. yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I just lost the screen. Okay. Shall I do a bit of a reading, Nabi? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, I was yeah. that. That was what I was. Uh, maybe we'll read a few. Uh, we'll we'll uh, listen to your poems. Uh. Okay, I'll I'll do a few. I'll I'll do pray maybe. Uh, Leela mentioned that. Uh, uh -huh. I'll Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you were saying earlier about growing up in Wales, uh, Nabi, and this yeah. is a poem about that very much. You know, a sort of. A memory poem of, of those days. Uh, we we lived in a little terraced house, typical sort of mining village house, kind of facing the colliery, facing the the big uh, slag heaps of of uh, spoil, you know, from the, from the coal mining that was sort of opposite on the opposite side of the valley. So every morning we woke up looking out onto this big mountain of, of um, waste big mountain of coal waste uh, and the uh, and the pit head over there so this is a, a, a kind of poem partly on uh, partly based on that that sort of memory called pray the past is always watching curtains twitching in the windows of its model houses that are small enough to lodge in a toddler's nostril on their miniature rooftops, a remembered sun is always glinting after remembered rain. I have become like one of those sad grown men who must keep his children away from the delicate train set in the attic. The mouse-sized pristine engines in Edwardian reds and greens, toothpick trees as brittle as icing. What kind of game exactly is this that only makes us understand just how clumsy we've become? All thumbs, breaking everything we touch in time. I see Clive Terrace, its bending road as thin as a coat hanger's wire neck. And with a sound as faint as the tick of a watch, one of the tiny doors is opening. Why did we never look up and see our own shaped shadows across the mountain? 
could we ever hear anyway from this terrible height but our own small voices the shouting Love. <laughs> there's a question there i'm seeing in chat from leela what are your views on writing retreats uh, uh, uh maybe, yeah uh there's a what are your views on writing retreats maybe if, if you have a few more uh your poems then maybe we, yeah. we can oh, okay uh, we'll do those yeah okay uh i'll do a maybe a poem that isn't in uh fossil record um do a couple of, of ones that were a bit more recent than that that came out in various journals over the last few years uh there's one called um soft unbreakable creatures uh which which actually i wrote in the van this is one of those poems that did come to me quite quickly it was uh, it was after taking the van quite near benachy just getting into the forestry areas around there and uh, there was one very windy night one kind of night where you could really hear the the pine trees you know it's like being in the middle of an ocean and I woke up about three in the morning, I think, and uh, and scribbled down this poem, and uh, changed it a little bit over the over the weeks afterwards. But this this is one of those poems that came quite quickly. Um, it mentions a French poet, uh, Jacques Ote, uh, who was a wonderful wonderful nature poet. Um, I don't think there's much of his work translated into English. But uh, he's got a wonderful image in one of his poems about silence being like a servant that kind of, you know, moves around us and, and mm -hmm. kind of tidies things up, you know, and uh, it's a lovely image. So I, I reference that in the poem. So if you're wondering who Jacquette is, he's, he's a great French poet. Derek Mann translated a selected poems by him, so it's well worth getting hold of. Um, he wrote a lot of poems about mountains and nature. So, yeah. anyway, soft, unbreakable creatures. Soft, unbreakable creatures travel the deep sea staircase all night, all day, like Jacquette's servant silence, clearing whatever speech is left the smeared glasses and forks, the table's mulberry ringed cloth, of the act itself, always in parenthesis always between the surface of the sea and its buried woods that were the world once, its drowned desert floors. The syntax of the rolling processes making more or less known, the mid-Atlantic waves that seem to surge tonight like thought through the trees. Simple rain long before life was the first impatient wanderer leaving its small footprints for a short time everywhere. So that was, uh, that was a fan poem. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll see if I can. Okay. I'll read another little nature poem, maybe. Uh, this one's uh, it's about, this is a Scottish, more of a Scottish poem. Uh, years and years ago, I remember going fishing on the Tweed, on the River Tweed down the borders. It was back when I was living in Edinburgh and I'd gone across to uh, Peebles for the day to, to do a little bit of fishing. And uh, I got carried away and completely missed my bus. And, uh, I got stuck in Peebles overnight. I think I ended up having to sleep in the bus station. But uh, I remember trying to walk back along the river, uh, and it was dark. You know, the dark was coming down. I was I was too late to get back in time for the bus. And uh, an owl just flew almost into my face. You know, I was walking along the oh, wow. track, and an owl just came st out of the shadows. And uh, I remember just being stunned by this you know ducking and it, and it kind of swept <laughs> swept over my head but uh, anyway the poem's called passing owl and the memory of owl just after dusk in a wooded spot along the salmon fisher's path on the banks of the tweed 
Mist was spilling into the world from the clinking shallows of the river. I think it was nothing more, that creature, than inches from the skull that cups my brain in place and offers it up to every passing thing, a glimpsed face as flat as the dial of a clock, the moon, the constellations. Now, I mean, you say saying earlier about poems, you know, how old they are, and whether you go back to them and so on. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I suppose that's an example of a poem where the thing itself happened like years and years ago, probably uh -huh. 30, 30 years ago now, maybe more. Uh, that's a relative reason. And you never know when things are just going to jump back into your head. And, yeah, and ask, ask for a poem. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe if, if we have time, then uh, we can uh, do some reading later on. Uh, uh, just to get, getting back into uh, uh, Leela's question, what are your views on writing retreats? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think um, they're more expensive than going away in your van. I would, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it's quite expensive to have to buy a van. So I don't know. <laughs> but I think the benefits well, are quite similar. <laughs> Yeah. The benefits are quite similar, I think. Uh, it, I mean, it's different because a writing retreat is more communal. Um, you know, you might, it, depending on the kind of retreat, you might be getting some kind of instruction, you might be getting some kind of mentoring. Uh, that makes a difference. Um, I, I think really, it, it, it really comes down to what works for you you know, as a writer. I mean, I think some people really respond well to having people around them and having prompts and having encouragement to, to start on things. Uh, and other people just need to be, you know, left alone, just need a bit of peace and quiet. So it's, it's a very personal thing, I think. And I think what you need to do is try out different ways of giving yourself space to write you know and that might be writing retreats it might be retreats where you get input from other people or it might be retreats where you're just completely on your own um, but I think try out different things and whatever works for you uh, try and try and build that into your life you know but it's very personal I think it's totally different for different people um, depending on your own temperament uh, and depending as well on what your day-to-day -day life is like. I think if you have a day-to-day -day life that's full of people, then you probably need solitude, you know, to, to get any writing done. You probably need a contrast. Whereas if your life doesn't involve a lot of people around you, then maybe uh, you'd really benefit from a more communal type retreat. Um, so yeah, it's it. There's no, no one size fits all. I think uh, it's just whatever, whatever frees you up and whatever makes you feel like you've got permission to, to give yourself time to write. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, uh, I was quite uh, because as as a poet myself, you know, like, uh, you know, talking about the woods and going out um, into the wild uh, or being in solitude, I I see fishing, you know, like. Uh, the very rustic or natural environment in, in your in your poems, and um, now I've done myself as well. Uh, I've gone out wild camping, you know, solo camping, and done a lot of writing, which is quite conducive. So, uh, as coming back again to a camper van, you know, like, do you think <laughs> that that type of going out in the wild in uh, you know in a camper van or let's say camping, you know, does, does, yeah, does yeah. It boost? You know, like Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think it's like we were saying earlier about going somewhere where different languages are spoken to, to what you're familiar with. You know, nature speaks its own language, you know, certainly not our language. And I think immersing yourself in that, immersing yourself in complete speechlessness, you know, so that you're just quiet, you're amongst wildlife, nature, the elements, I think is brilliant. I think it's absolutely uh, beneficial. And I, I think it's, it's beneficial for the same reason. You know, you're basically surrounded with a different language. You're surrounded by 
that kind of wordlessness, that sort of speechlessness, and that, again, it throws you back on non-habitual ways of looking at the world and experiencing the world around you and other creatures around you. You know, it's, uh, yeah, so. That's really inspiring. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, we are coming to end. You teach creative writing in uh, uh, university. You have taught in different universities as well, and right now in Aberdeen University yeah. as well, and abroad as well, and maybe uh, China or yeah, done done a few residencies here. Yeah. So what as a as a as a teacher of uh, uh, like of creative writing, can the craft of writing be honed? It's it's a very uh, yeah. you know hacking yeah. like, but still, you know, yeah. and how important it is to learn the craft of writing. Yeah, I think it's. I think the reason why, you know, the question keeps coming out, people struggle with it, is, it in a way there are two very different parts to it. You know, I mean, and and I think the two sides of it often get confused in people's minds. You know, people think, well, how can you teach somebody to be creative? And the truth is, you probably can't, but you, you can teach somebody to. Uh, value their own creativity better and you can teach somebody to listen to their own creativity better to pay attention to it and to give more space to it and to you know respect it in those kinds of ways and you can certainly teach uh, the mechanics of writing you can certainly help somebody to understand why one line is good and one line is bad that's that's not subjective you know, you can break the rhythm very easily just by putting a, a dud word in. Uh, and it's quite easy to point out to people uh, why, you know, how that works. Um, you know, if you think about something as simple as a pop song, you know, it's very easy to ruin a line of a pop song just by, you know, sticking the wrong word in or sticking an extra word in or leaving a word out. And the same is true for poetry and for prose, you know. So so that kind of mechanical side of, of why one sentence or maybe a lie works well and why changing it doesn't work so well, that's quite easy. I think, you know, there's no argument that you can help people to understand why one thing works better than another. Um, the mysterious thing is, can you make somebody into a writer? And yeah, no, you can't. In the same way that you can't make somebody into a gifted musician. You know, you can teach somebody how to play scales, but you can't give them the flair to compose a beautiful piece of music, you know. But what you can do is encourage somebody who has got a bit of talent, who has got that, that kind of desire to write and has got that love of, say, poetry. What you can do is encourage them to give space to it so that they can then develop the gift they've got. And very often, there's a hell of a lot more talented people than they realize. You know, so if they just get that encouragement and just learn different ways to unlock the talent they've got within them, it's often really surprising uh, how much natural ability people have. You know, so yeah, a big part of the job of teaching creative writing, I think, is encouragement. You know, is just encouraging people to trust themselves and to to trust their own creativity and to try things out and not to feel embarrassed or self conscious about it. Yeah, yeah, that, that was quite insightful. And uh, maybe we can uh, open questions. And a few questions uh, over here I've got in uh, uh, message. But before that, uh, maybe we, Gopis was waiting for that. Uh, yeah. Go please uh, yourself and sure. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. Hi, Gopish. Hi, yeah. Hey, how are we doing? Sir? All right, thanks. Yeah. Uh, my name is Gopish, like I said, and and I'm from Nepal, and I I'm new to poems, and and I had a question of poetry rules. Yeah. Are are are, are there any any certain rules? that a poet should follow while writing the poems are 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 the rules meant to be broken yeah i think the only really golden rule garbage is 
that you should try to get the words sounding right for whatever it is you're writing about, if you see what I mean. So if you think of it in musical terms, if what you want to express is a, is a sad song, then you're going to write it in a minor key. You know, you're not going to write it in a major key. It just wouldn't sound right. It just wouldn't convey the feeling that you're trying to get across. And if you're thinking of that as like in language terms, then it comes down to thinking what kind of rhythm do my words have? You know, how quick, quick or how slow does this line move? And, you know, does it feel right when I read it out loud? Does it capture something of the feeling and the spirit that I'm trying to get at? You know, so that's the only rule as such. I don't think, I mean, very few poets now, very po few poets in any period um, have stuck very strictly to rules, you know, about how many syllables you can use or where the rhymes come in or whether there are or aren't rhymes. And I think those kinds of rules aren't helpful when you're learning poetry. It's fine to train yourself. It's fine to give yourself a challenge and say, right, I'm going to write a traditional sonnet, you know, and I'm going to have this rhyme scheme. You know, that could be really helpful. It can really help you to develop your skills. But to begin with, I think the most important thing is to, to learn how to match the, the spirit of what you're trying to communicate, try and match that with the feeling of how the words sound, with the rhythm, with the length of the line, with where the, the, the end of the line comes. You know, that can make a big difference. Um, as an example, Gopish, a uh, very mm -hmm. famous line of poetry uh, by Keats, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. It's the start of Ode to a Grecian. Now, if you think about how different that sounds, if you just change the order of the words uh, and say something like, a beautiful thing is forever a joy, that's terrible. <laughs> that's not poetry. You know, even though Keats would be saying the same thing, one is poetry, one isn't poetry. And I think that all the difference comes in the order of the words, the rhythm of that line, the fact that the line ends with the word forever that kind of draws you on into a feeling of timelessness. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. And it kind of, you know, resonates on into the rest of the poem. So hopefully you can see with that little example that it's not really a question of rules. It's more a question of putting the words in the right order so that they they generate the feeling that you want your poem to have. Does that make sense, Gosh? Well, okay, it does. Thank you so much, Darwin. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah awesome. Mm -hmm. We have another. Uh, we have another question over here on my. Uh, uh, Samir Gautam uh, from Nepal. Uh, he say he asks us like, why modern writers are more inclined to write poems. Which lack meters and rhymes, you know. Like yeah. Why they're right. I think, yeah. Yeah. That's an understandable. I would say that a lot of contemporary poetry, it's not that it lacks uh, meter and rhyme, it'll often lack um, traditional meters, but what it won't lack is rhythm. And very often you'll find that it's not completely lacking in rhyme either. It's simply using half rhymes or para rhymes or hidden rhymes, internal rhymes, you know, there's almost always a musicality and an organizing rhythm to even the most experimental uh, contemporary poems. It's just that contemporary writers, I think, tend to hide those things more. Not always. Uh, some contemporary writers quite enjoy using traditional forms, but um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a very different kind of challenge. Uh, Norman McCaig, who's a great Scottish poet and uh, mainly wrote free verse, um, but also could write very beautiful traditional poems too. But he always claimed that writing in free verse was much harder because, you know, you don't have a structure to follow. So you have to, for each poem, you have to invent the correct rhythm. You have to find the correct rhythm 
at the uh, the correct cadence. So, yeah, it's an interesting argument. I think I think there are benefits certainly when uh, you're kind of starting off with poetry. I think there are benefits in giving yourself the challenge of working with traditional forms, um, just to to learn how they work and to. Uh, give yourself that that sort of discipline because it forces you to be creative in different ways. Um, Elizabeth Bishop, the great American poet, once said, uh, she wrote interestingly about the way in which using a rhyme scheme forces your imagination to come up, to make leaps that otherwise it wouldn't make because you have to find a particular sort of rhyme. And she wrote very beautifully about the way in which that can that can unlock new possibilities in a poem that just would never have arisen if you're writing free verse. So yeah, it's it's a really interesting thing to think about, I think, as a poet. And as a young poet, I think you should try both. You know, uh, you should sort of get into the habit of uh, testing yourself with free verse and with uh, and with more traditional forms. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to read a few comments over here. So Uday Adhikari says, good encounter. P. Gautam says, wonderful and very interesting session going on. And Siam Gaire says, thank you for sharing. So those are the comments. And uh, lastly, I think uh, Leela, if you're over there, if you have any questions before we uh, come to the end. I think, uh, yeah. Oh, let's see if there's any. Uh, Lila Didi, if you are there, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself or. Oh, oh okay. uh, yeah. yeah. I was just saying it's been a real. Oh, you muted again, Lila. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was saying that it was. Oh, the host has asked you to start. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to have met you, or even though it's on Zoom. And uh, thank you, Naveen, for inviting me. If you ever have another session like this, I'd like to be included. Uh, I have written poetry, uh, but I'm not. I wouldn't call myself a poet. I'm part of the Lemon Tree Writers. Oh, then, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great. And also um, Poetry Space, which is based in Dorset. So I've written poetry all the time that I was in school, and uh, several were published. But um, there was a gap because I did medicine and went into a very busy sort of schedule. Uh, but after retirement and uh, due to COVID, they've been writing more sort of poetry. So I do enjoy it. Uh, not a poet of the distinction at all, but I've had a few things, especially in the anthology brought out by the Lemon Tree writers. I've had one uh, there and another one with the poetry space. So. Oh, uh, excellent. I'll look out for your work, Leela, because uh, <laughs> okay. I often, I've done a few things with Lemon Tree writers, you know, like workshops and things over the years. So, yeah. um, and I've got some of their anthologies, um, you know, going way back, really. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'm not sure if I've got, when, when was your work? In this, the, it was just this year. It's ah, of, right. I haven't got that uh, one because. Uh, yeah, Twist yeah. of Lemon. Uh, twist ah, lemon. great, great. Yeah, I'll look out for that, Leela. Uh, I've got quite a few friends in, in Lemon Tree, uh, people who have been in it for years, like Mart, you know, Mart Walsh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, good. Keep keep writing, Leela. And uh, okay. Yeah, brilliant. And Thank thanks for you. coming. It was lovely to meet you. Yeah. Maybe Thank meet you. you in person at some yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And... Uh, Okay. Is there a time for uh, one more question, uh, Vincent? Uh, yeah. okay. I, I had a I, quick question for uh, uh, yeah. when. When uh, is it okay for you? Short yeah, question. Yeah. Short yeah. question. Yeah, short yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to be really short. So, hmm. uh, 
my question to you is uh, were you born a poet or is it uh, uh, something that you had achieved through a, a hard work and de dedication uh i think i think uh people are certainly born with a kind of sensitivity to language you know in the same way that some people are born with a sensitivity to to kind of being able to play chess very well or something you know i, th I think everybody's born with different kind of uh, biases in their brains you know some people are much better naturally at mathematics others at linguistics and, and so on um, and so I would say that probably everybody who writes everybody who's got like a, an urge to write um, has probably been born with that natural predisposition to be fascinated by language you know and that natural sympathy for language um, and I think what, what makes a difference then maybe in terms of whether or not you go on to write a lot of poetry or a lot of fiction or something is partly upbringing, you know, is partly just what happens to you as a, as a young child. And I think if you're maybe quite an introverted person, then maybe you're more likely to spend your time writing or dreaming up stories as a young child rather than going out and you know, socializing with a lot of other friends. So I think there are all kinds of different things that, that go into the mix, you know. Um, and then you mentioned hard work. And I think, yeah, that's that's really important too. You know, you can have that kind of natural predisposition to write and to create things in words, but uh, it does take a lot of hard work, I think, to, to polish that, to get better at it. And more than anything it takes a lot of reading you know and i think a lot of a lot of young writers that i teach the one thing holding them back is that they don't read enough you know they're not interested in reading other people's writing and i think that that can really hold people back as well you know you have to realize that you're part of a conversation you know that uh, that when you write something you're you're contributing to something that other people are part of too you know, it's not just all about one person, you know, uh, so should never be too egotistical about what we're doing. You know, I think we're always, we're always part of, we're all trying to solve the same mystery. <laughs> we're all trying to, to you know, uh, contribute to understanding the mystery of human life. And uh, that's a commonal thing, you know, something we all share. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Yep, that's all. Let's go, please. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, thanks, sir. Uh, when uh, I'll just. Oh, thanks, yeah. Toby. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there are a few more questions, but I think uh, I mean, if you can put it, we'll put, we'll send it through email, and maybe uh, if uh, if when it's yeah. happy. Yeah. 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 There's, a, there's a few questions from Sam there as well. So I'll put it in the email. So, yeah. Uh, uh, and once again, I think uh, we are, the time is uh, off today. And I want to thank uh, Wen for, uh, for coming over here in this online session. And <laughs> it, it, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, you know, like honored, uh, very privileged to have my guru you know, like uh, uh, chat with me after so many years. I think I've known Wen for the past 14 years and we've been constant touch. And um, uh, I'm happy to confess that I've, I've be, you've been my uh, inspiration all throughout, you know, for so many years. Uh -huh. And and uh, uh, your poems matter, you know, like it's, 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 it's your, your poems matter to the world, you know, it means a lot. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and as Lila Didi said, that we'll try to do one in person event, you know, yeah, in the future, we'll try yeah. to send you a request, you know, yeah. uh, if we can do that. And thanks again. Uh, this video will be uh, in the YouTube and uh, Mr. Mountain website as well. So for those uh, who couldn't join online right now, you can watch later as well. And uh, thanks once again uh, for being here. When it was a, a wonderful. Uh, privilege listening to you and to your poems and thanks friends 
around the world. If there's anything you'd like to say, then we can before we close up. Uh, thanks, yeah, thank and thanks everybody. Uh, thank you so, uh, so much, Dr. Wayne, for uh, sharing your thoughts and and, and I would like to thank uh, Nagun sir for inviting me and uh, giving a chance to uh, share my questions. I mean, ask questions and, and then being a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Gopesh. Take care. Thanks, yeah, yeah, take care. Bye.